So everyone, uh, welcome to Coach Week. Uh, happy Coach Week to you all. Um, and welcome to our seminar this morning, our webinar, where we get to listen to a very, very experienced person on the topic of coaching upwards. And I like our title, it's, it's to coach upwards or not to coach upwards, that is the question. And I have tapped into, or we have tapped into one of the greatest resources we have um, to actually help us answer that question today. So this is Natalie. Natalie Ashdown here with you from Open Door Coaching and on behalf of our wonderful partners in Coach Week Synergy Global, um, I'd like to welcome you to the webinar. If you'd like to interact with us, please interact via the chat box. We can pick that up and, and give your questions and comments. Um, and I can see that uh, Heather Jane Gray is on the line, our CEO of Synergy Global. So welcome to you, Heather Jane, and thanks for the, the opportunity to partner with you. So we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodians of the land on which we meet today and their continuing connection to the land, the waters and the communities of Australia. And we pay our respects to them and to their elders past, present and emerging. So today, our agenda for the day is to introduce you to our keynote speaker, uh, talk about what is coaching upwards, why is it so important? Uh, when should we do it? And when do we need to do it? And when should we do it? And then we're going to look at the five P's of coaching upwards as well and take all your questions and answer all your questions as we go. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Air Commodore Ian Scott. Ian has enjoyed a long career with flying in operations for the Royal Australian Air Force and the Australian Defence Force. He's held command level uh, he's held command at squadron wing and group levels and he was appointed as a member of the order of australia in 1996 for his service as commanding officer of number 37 squadron ian has held a number of staff positions culminating in the post of chief of staff of headquarters at air command in glenbrook and he transferred to the air force reserves with the rank of air command air commodore in march 2005 and he undertakes a range of projects and tasks for defense in the reserve since 2015 when i first met um, ian on our certificate for Foreign workplace and business coaching program and he put me through my hoops for sure um, ian's been focused mainly on coaching under the air force leadership coaching program overseeing the program in air command and maintaining the impetus to embed a coaching mindset in leaders at all levels of Air Force. He's a passionate Rotarian. He has a few ex-service activities and memberships that keep him busy. Married to his lovely wife, Jennifer, with two adult daughters, three grandchildren, and enjoys bushwalking and reading. Ian Scott, welcome to The Line. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks, Natalie. It's really great to be here. And let me say that the, uh, so far the coaching week has been really, really cool. And, um, I know there'll be some Air Force coaches online today, and I think that the fact we've got an Air Force co coaching leadership program uh, coaching week lined up for everyone as well is really, really good. It's a great opportunity, and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Yeah, I, I loved it how yesterday you said to us that you thought the program was bonza. And I'm like, shouldn't we bring back that word? I reckon we are having a bonza time together and I think we should bring back that word into our vocabulary a lot more. And it was so great to see um, um, Air Force's um, program for Coach Week as well. I'm really hoping to tap into those recordings um, at some point and learn from um, all the Air Force coaches as well. Yeah, well, um, you're our mother, so that's why we should. But, you know, talking about culture um, and bonza and welcome to country reminds me that um, th what we're going to talk about today may be um, harder in some cultures than others um, in some sort of expectations different societies have. But I think because we're taking a coaching approach, um, it does transfer across cultures. Um, obviously, I'm going to be talking from a fairly white Anglo-Saxon perspective, um, and um, that needs to be, I think, kept in mind. But if we just think about a coaching approach to what we're doing, um, it will transfer rather easily. And I thought I'd say that given that you've managed to attract a worldwide audience um, for this week, which is superb. Thank you. And it's very great of you to acknowledge that. Absolutely. 
So Ian, if we uh, move on, we're also, as I mentioned, going to talk about the culture. So thank you for um, raising that as well. Would you like to uh, share with us, um, and let me hand over to you so I can learn from you as I always do. When you think about coaching upwards, let me just hand that over to you and, and um, you, can, you can share your wisdom with us. Sure. <clears throat> so generally speaking, coaching upwards is when we're coaching the boss, someone in your command chain, if you like. But in fact, it might be more useful to consider that coaching upwards is whenever there's any power gradient between parties. So that can be military rank, it can be a hierarchy, it can be the performance reporting chain, but also less obviously, it might be your clients, uh, it might be your um, friends, it might be somebody who holds informal power in a, in a situation. Um, so it's not just applicable to work, but it applies to social activities, perhaps, your football club uh, or volunteer organisations, as I might well know. And you can come up against it when there is no structured hierarchy. Um, it's very similar to having a crucial conversation, and that's where we use our coaching skills. Um, we use them in two ways. We coach ourselves to prepare for this coaching upwards, and then in the session with the boss, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today, the boss really, is where the skills like good listening and good questioning come in. Look, it needs to be face-to-face -face or at the very least on the phone. Um, because you can imagine how fraught it would be for the parties when they actually enter this um, coaching upwards if it's not just part of normal practice. And you don't want an email or an SMS message being misinterpreted because you would know that from uh, that, those forms of communication, we, we miss out on all the body language, the gestures, which I'm actually making now and you can't see them, um, the stance, the tone and timbre of your voice, all of this adds so much to our conversation and the message we're transmitting. So we don't want to get this wrong um, by sending an e trying to do it by email. But you don't need to be scared of it either because the outcomes can be really good um, for everybody concerned. So that's what coaching upwards is, Natalie. Thank you, thank you. So why is it important? And I'm gonna be rabbiting on here a bit, but I hope, uh, Natalie, if you do find some questions on the chat that you could interrupt me. So most organizations will aim for a collaborative culture, um, one where everybody's efforts, their out output, their ideas, their thoughts are all aimed at achieving the same objective. And that requires a fairly clearly articulated and understood vision with aligned action and a lot of trust in each other. And that's, uh, that's in spades with the military. So not surprisingly, the ability to coach freely up and down and sideways helps to build those relationships. And it's a chicken and egg, I suppose, but if we are able to speak freely with our bosses and they're able to speak freely to us, um, it builds trust and then that strengthens the relationship and that strengthens the collaborative culture. And I know this is a cliche, but it's all about relationships. Now, when we talk about collaborative teams, we often talk about individuals being aligned with the organization, but we shouldn't forget the bosses, the managers and the leaders also need to be aligned with the organization. So if it's desirable to have all the cogs uh, working together for an output, then it's clearly not desirable to have one of them ratcheting away on its own. And perhaps when we talk a bit more about the situation where you might coach upwards, that will become a bit clearer. Um, and being able to coach upwards is truly walking the talk. If supervisors have got a coaching mindset, then they take the opportunity to develop their people in the best interest of the people and the organisation, whatever that is. And then it follows that they should also welcome the same opportunities. And there's a saying that it's lonely at the top. Well, it is if you don't have a relationship where people will talk to you. Um, so I guess the importance is that it's good for people, it's good for the organisation, it's good for getting things done and moving forward and growing uh, as an organisation. 
Yeah, thank you, um, Ian. And uh, they're getting quite a bit of a response on the chat now um, to some of the thoughts you've offered already. So Sam has said um, about the rank of a person, how it could be held unconsciously by the person. Um, and experience is the thing that most often provides unconscious ranks within issues uh, in organisations. So um, your, your comment around uh, rank or hierarchy across different activities um, is definitely resonating with people. Yeah, I'm a little side anecdote. When I did join Rotary, um, I thought I was a pretty good leader. After all, I've been leading for a long time in the Air Force. And I believe that uh, the people who thought I was a good boss in the Air Force did things for me because I was a good boss. But when I went to lead in Rotary and tried the same thing, it didn't work. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. so it is um, that expectation to get built up. And that's why I brought up the fact before about the informal power. Who really is running um, the organisation? Who's, who's the person that is actually holding levers that you need to perhaps have manoeuvred. Yeah. And um, whether we like it or not, rank does get in the way. And that's why in Air Force, we do our coaching with, uh, without wearing uniform. We wear civilian clothing. Yeah, all right. That's great. Thank you. Um, then the question comes, well, okay, I've said it's important, but when, when, when do we need to do it? Um, when should we do it? Well, the first thing is, when you're asked to do it, I mean, it's really fantastic if your boss is asking you for feedback or coaching on a matter because it takes away that first step in coaching, the one of getting permission to coach. Um, but you should remember when your boss um, asked you for feedback that you don't just leap in and go, well, I'm, I'm so glad you asked. Here's a long list of things that you need to improve to get on with this organisation. No, you don't want to do that. If the manager's asking you for feedback, they're trusting you and you need to take the approach that as if you were being given some feedback, what would you like to hear? And the manager might need you as a sounding board. So um, yeah, bounce it backwards and forwards. Understand what the manager wants from you. What the leader, I'm, I'm a bit of a leader man rather than a manager, but let's say whatever your leader wants from you, um, give it to them the way you would want to receive it. Now the hardest situation is when you feel you need to initiate it. Um, and how will you know? Well, you'll know that something's affecting the performance of you, of the boss, of the team, and it has to be dealt with. It's not just a minor irritation, it's something that's having a, a bit of a long-term impact. So that the um, examples might be, and I'd love to hear any examples from our, our chat, um, where there is no feedback going on in your organisation, or perhaps it's done poorly, it's not um, timely, it's not concise, it's not accurate, it's not sincere and all of those other good things we know. Um, or the person's, the boss or another's not aware of a performance issue he or she has that's impacting on others. So you feel that there's no, there's no feedback coming, we can't get on with it, we don't know um, whether we're heading in the right direction, uh, it's not done timely, you think that's a good example of where you might want to coach up. Well, there's a problem. Um, and the boss has got some destructive behavior going on um, that's impacting on you. And that could be, let's say negativity. What if your boss is always below the line? What if the boss is always bagging out everybody else? What if the boss is already always blaming somebody else for the lack of resources in your organization? As a self-aware coach you might say see that this is something that needs coaching upwards on so a behavior from the boss um, or um, an outcome from that behavior which is really causing an impact on your team um, and i think the last one is because i've talked a bit about Im improving feedback is the clarification of intent i mean honestly if you're not getting enough information and you're struggling with misinterpreting it, um, then you're disempowered. So if you're having to do a lot of rework, if your boss is changing that um, document every time you go back in there, if the boss is moving the goalposts around, it might be time to actually do that. Um, 
that coaching upwards. I'm just going to take a sip of water. Natalie, I don't know if there's any questions at the moment. Sorry, have to take myself off mute. Yeah, I, I think I, I'm really appreciating your examples there, Ian, because I think all of us on the line could relate to at least one or two of those examples. Um, so Eden has actually offered that, um, he suggests that uh, a psychological safe workplace helps create trust both up and down in a hierarchical structure. So that's exactly what you were talking about, Ian, when you're talking about why it's important from a, a cultural point of view. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Vanessa's actually asked a question which I think we'll pick up. Let me read it to you and then I think we'll pick it up when we talk about the five P's actually. But she says, um, what if a boss asks for feedback and does not give, uh, what if a boss asks for feedback and does not give time to answer? So they don't give the time, the airspace or they shut people down. How would you approach that? So it's mm. a bit, uh, what I'm hearing is like the boss has asked for feedback but they are actually not allowing you the actual time to respond. So yeah. perhaps yeah, you can pick that up in the five P's, but yeah. Yeah, because it sounds a bit like it's a box ticking exercise on the boss. Um, and that's why at the start we said, you need to um, walk the talk um, mm. about this whole thing. I think we said at the start. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you did. Absolutely. Yeah. We will, if Vanessa, if we don't answer that properly, we'll please bring it, bring it up again. So guys, I'm going to give you, um, an example, and this uh, we don't need the five piece. Just. Sorry, sorry, I jumped. <laughs> okay. um, I'm going to give you an example, and this is a real life one. I'm one of those guys who um, learnt from his mistakes. That's why. <laughs> that's why I look as old as I am. No, no, um, I did actually learn a lot from my experience and mistakes. And boy, I wished I'd come across coaching a long, long time ago. But here's an example. So a detachment from a flying squadron had just returned after three months deployment on operations. So it was a long way away from home, this place. Um, they were pretty well left to themselves in terms of setting up their base and working with foreign colleagues on operations. Now that sounds a bit poor, but a while ago we would do things like that. We'd just uh, get together, boys, head over there. This is your job. See you when you get back. Um, look, they did a great job and they came home feeling very, very proud. Um, they were so happy to be home. They were so happy to have had a very, very successful deployment. And a few few weeks later, a senior officer came to thank them for their work, and which he did at a parade. And then he promptly got stuck into them for complaining to an army commander who'd visited them on deployment about their living conditions they'd complained about um, their living conditions, according to this senior officer. So he got stuck into them. But it turns out what they'd actually uh, had happened, sorry, what had happened is this uh, visiting army commander had asked them, um, what about your living conditions? And they were said, look, we're all fine. We just would like to get some air conditioners into the operations room. You know, that's where they're doing all their planning and taking all their messages and turning their orders out. And uh, the army chap thought, yeah, soft Air Force wallies. And he used that to needle our senior officer on how soft Air Force was. Well, of course, he's, our boss then stuck the needle into the boys and then um, they were very, very hurt and quite angry about that because they'd been accused in their mind of being whingers. But then the senior officer left straight away after the parade. He just dropped the little morale bomb and left and that made it worse. Now, there was one of my squadrons and I just couldn't leave it at that. And I, I had to coach upwards. I thought, I just cannot let this go on without standing up for the, for the, the, the guys. And I did that. And I said, basically, um, I, I said to the, the senior officer that um, he didn't really understand the impact his statement had made. And I, I talked to the boss a bit about it. I had a good rapport with him. Uh, I could ring up and and he was happy to let me loose on the phone. Um, and he, you know, he sort of said, no, no, look, honestly, I'm sorry, that wasn't a big thing. I really did appreciate the work. So I could go back to their squadron commanding officer and let him know that he didn't understand that that little barb at the end um, had really undermined everything that he'd said. So um, it worked well, it went well. Um, I was a terrified of doing it but i learned you could do it 
and that gave me the confidence to have those conversations and pity it didn't give me uh, also the confidence to go and do some coaching training and it would have been even better but it gave me the confidence and that's the one of the main things uh, that I got from that little example there's a few others but I won't go into them um, otherwise you might think we're all sort of um, like that in the Air Force and we're not we're lovely people so <laughs> let me then um, with that example in mind, let me just go through the five P's of coaching upwards, the things that I've learned from experience and also from um, doing the coaching and, and working with Natalie on these kind of things. The first thing, obviously, is to plan. So you really need to think through all of the issues when you've decided you might have to coach upwards. And here's where you can use the, the GROW model to work through the issues. Firstly, what is the behaviour, the action, or the omission that's concerning you? And is there a solution to that? And how can that solution be expressed as an action to take? So we don't want something waffly like, um, saying, oh, we'll all agree that there'll be um, better after action reviews. What does that mean? I don't know. Maybe you've got to be very specific. So let's agree that as part of all future projects, the schedule will include time for the boss and the team to review processes and outcomes. So you're very specific. You're not generalizing. They try to look around the emotion involved because A, you might be fairly anxious there might be other emotions uh, flying around. So just be aware of that. Try and look around for it for an outcome that's based on the issue and not the emotion. And as I say, you can't ignore it and it may be part of the solution, but make sure it's relative to the situation and not just because you're cranky with the boss. And um, so just be very careful with that. I'm just reminded of myself when I, stormed out of a senior officer's office because he wouldn't agree with me. <laughs> I, got a, I got about 10 yards down the corridor. Yes, it was not that long ago. <laughs> 10 metres down the corridor. And I went, what am I doing? Uh, this is really not helping my argument. And I went back in. I didn't get what I wanted, but I realised that the emotion wasn't the answer. But anyway, think it all through. Uh, take time. Write down especially write down all the issues that can help. Uh, keep it as simple as possible and don't go in with a raft of demands. De deal in specifics, okay? So deal in specifics, not general statements. So you want to say something like, the delay in getting this directive meant the guys had to work long hours to, work to, to make the deadline. And rather than saying something like, we always get direction from you at the last minute. So be specific, don't generalise. While you're planning, think about the boss's perspective. What's he focused on? Who knows what's pressing the boss's buttons? So you need to understand their story. Try to understand their story before you do it because it might um, give you a bit clearer understanding of how to approach it. What is pressing his buttons? Maybe coaching upwards can be to find a solution to that as well and test your assumptions, right? You've written them all down, so test them. So you're gonna question the inferences you've drawn about the situation. Um, so you're saying to yourself, well, he just stuck the needle in uh, because he just doesn't care about the squadron. Well, maybe not. Maybe he stuck the needle in because he had a needle stuck in him. So question the inferences you've drawn. Um, use open questions on yourself, including why questions. So why would the boss not like that squadron? Um, so really just test your inferences and especially test the one about whether you should be doing the coaching upwards uh, and whether it's actually needed as well. I'll just draw a breath here. <laughs> I feel like I'm lecturing, sorry. No, absolutely. Um, I think uh, I think everyone's like me, um, Ian, and we're all taking notes. And um, Di's actually um, popped in the chat box here um, 
situation behavior impact outcome. So the SBIO model uh, is a good one to use with planning. And I can hear oh, yeah. exactly the situation behavior impact outcome uh, in what you're actually saying there. And what I think I like about what you're saying is that we're doing this in preparation and we're mm. asking these questions of ourselves and potentially asking questions of others in the workplace before we, as we're doing that planning. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think our little P for practice is going to um, emphasise that too. Um, let me just run on to the purpose. And this is our second P. We've got to make it positive. Uh, it's got to be a good outcome for you, the boss and the organisation. And the best thing is to try and frame it in terms of goals that the boss has or the organisation has, or if you're really collaborative, um, the, the both of both has the boss and the organization so you know you might say something like if i've talked about before about reviewing processes with the boss periodically in your project you might say the pot the process is going to help to build continuous improvement into project performance so you might go in and say with this purpose in mind you don't have to spell it out at the front but the purpose is to actually build continuous improvement into project performance. So rather than sort of say my purpose is to stop the boss doing this, it's to get a better outcome. So you've got to think through that purpose. And I'm, I can't give you a zillion examples because they're going to be so situation specific. P number three, I think is very important. And this comes back to uh, the difficult conversations model as well to run through the conversation so be aware of your body language be, be aware of your feelings and how you are and speak it out loud i um, often do make speeches i prepare them i like to write them down as i'm going to speak them um, but then i really speak it out loud because if you speak it out loud and it sounds wrong then redo it and here's a good case for rehearsing with a colleague, someone that, uh, that you trust, and just work with that colleague and say, how did that come over? And have a discussion about it. Let them coach you. But whatever, you've got to be flexible because you don't want to overscript it. You walk into the office, you open your mouth, you start talking and the boss says, yeah, gosh, I wished I hadn't done that. I'm sorry. Why don't we just work out a bit? And you're still going, and then you did this and then you did that. And then you, so be flexible. You don't know what you're going to run into. Um, and we don't want to stick to the script when it's all stopped. Now the practice. We've, this is the point where we've got to say, well, how am I going to open this conversation? Don't forget to start with permission. Remember when the boss asks you for coaching, that is the permission. But if you're going to uh, give him some coaching, then you need to seek that permission. And it's really easy. You can just say, hey, boss, um, great uh, presentation today. Can I talk to you about a few ideas that came up? And then when you get that permission, you can go ahead. So see how it's so closely related to coaching principles. And then the fourth P is to pick the time and place. So you want to make sure the boss is in a good mood, um, that you're in a good mood, that work tempo is not too high. Um, you don't want to walk into the office when someone else has just come out um, holding their head as if they've just had a right bollocking. So get the boss in a good mood. You be in a good mood. Make sure the tempo is right. Don't try to do it you know, in the coffee room with everybody else there. Um, it's got to be somewhere where you can be confidential and private. And then just, um, just start. Um, and the last P is plan B, in case it goes wrong. And um, this is where you have to think through, I've really crafted my approach. This is going to be so good. The boss is going to see the wisdom in what I've asked, uh, what I've, um, told him and it's going to go so well but then the boss starts shredding you or is obviously not interested or is obviously distracted or you've picked the wrong mood uh, you have to have a plan b to back off from the situation and when you do that um, my advice is to put it on yourself 
um, sorry, sorry, boss, I'm not expressing myself may, uh, well here. Maybe we can come back to this issue another time or uh, you know, I don't feel I'm being clear. Can I, can I come back to you on this? So try to put it on yourself a little and then um, back out of it. But if it does go as intended, you can come up with shared outcomes with the boss. You know, you guys can coach each other. It's really cool. And make sure then that you follow up with that. And I think finally, make sure that you don't have to coach upwards all the time when it's just negative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Give positive feedback too. And uh, basically get, really just build that sort of culture where people are happy to be coached. They're happy to take advice from you. Um, and it works up, down and sideways. So if they do ask you for feedback, uh, as a sort of a summary here, you just go into coaching mode. You don't start giving them feedback. You go, sure, uh, what areas are you looking at specifically, boss? And then start coaching. So I might pause there, uh, Nat, to see how we're going with chat. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's the, the chats. Um, the chats are running there. It's I'll I'll pick up the comments now. Um, so Shirley is saying it's really interesting. She's had a flashback to my not so successful attempt to coach upwards, uh, and she feels that uh, she could have done it so much better. So she's thanking you, Ian. Um, <laughs> I think we're all thinking about ways that we could have done it better, and if we had the five P's, we might have been uh, been uh, better positioned. And, uh, and the other uh, question I was going to ask you um, is also around stating the purpose in the positive. So I noticed you were doing a bit of reframing there. So not saying, oh, this is what's wrong, this is what's wrong, but you are taking quite a bit of time there, I think, Ian, to reframe what you've got to say in the positive. Would, mm, you, would yeah. you agree with that? Absolutely. Um, Natalie, I just uh, think back to strength-based coaching i think back to strength-based feedback and you know i know how well we all react to being told you're really good at this and um and you know there's lots of um chance here in this organization to grow that and we really appreciate your input now these things make us feel really good and so you need to think in that same sense um with coaching upwards is basically coach to the boss's strength. Now, okay, we're talking about difficult conversations. Um, and if the boss is awake to it all, um, that then the boss will understand uh, that a positive outcome is possible and you're not making them feel like a twit. So rather than uh, tell somebody to stop doing something, you ask them to do what you want. It's a bit like, um, oh, what was the example? Um, a child, I think I read this one. Every so often, a child will pick up a glass of milk filled to the brim and they'll start coming over towards you and most parents will go, stop, 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 don't spill your milk. What happens? They stop, they spill the milk. Um, so the idea of this is to say, oh, Johnny, yeah, hold your milk with two hands, come over here and let's really enjoy it. <laughs> now that sounds, that doesn't sound very military, does it? Um, <laughs> but... It works. We, we all rise to positive outcomes. We rise to, um, to the idea of being told what we can do, not what we can't do. So it, it's very deep and involved, and I'm not in the position or the uh, professional space to unpick it, but we react so well to that positive outcome rather than being told to stop doing something. Yes, I 100% I agree with you. There's lots of research to back that up as well, Ian. And uh, the other thought I had is uh, I can hear you coaching the grandkids as well. <laughs> so <laughs> that was a great little insight there um, as well. Just um, looping back there to uh, Vanessa's question, mm. she, uh, I wonder whether it's picked up in the the um, fourth P, pick the time and place, because she did ask, but what if the boss just doesn't have the time or it's not going to set aside the time or the airspace or shuts people down? So would yeah. you pick that up under the fourth P, time and place? I'm just thinking about that All with right. you. Um, yes, and I'd also pick it up through plan. To think mm, plan, yeah. Um, uh, if... If there's a pattern of this, then obviously when you're going to test your assumptions, you're going to actually come up maybe with the answer that 
the person doesn't really want it. Um, but if they do need it, in your humble opinion, then perhaps you should persevere. Oops, there's another P. Um, but that would mean you would have to try to pin the person down. And in a way, we're sort of um, on the fringes of coaching when we're trying to do that. But I, you might have to ask yourself, why does the boss ask for coaching and then, or feedback, let's call it feedback, and then not accept it or not create the space? And you can only do what you can do, which is try to create the space and the trust um, and then to um, understand in picking the time and place, are you going to be there for them? Can you, can you be there for them or are they not there? If they're not there, it won't work anyway. But I think the planning stage would be for me where I would do that. Mm, thank you. And uh, I think I agree with you there, um, just thinking that through with you. The other question um, that's come up, um, thank you, Sam, for this question, is around um, how do the five Ps, have you got some thoughts about how the five Ps work uh, when we're working from home or working in isolation? Yeah, I do. I mean, here's where we really want our leaders to lead. Um, and I think our working from home, we are more, um, what's the word? We're, we're usually more needy of that social interaction with our hierarchy that we don't get. You know, it comes back to, it, it, is the um, direction clear? Do I understand what I've got to do? Do I understand my limits here? Um, I'll give you another little example from my career where um, I was in Darwin with a whole bunch of um, other folks and we were waiting to go off on a potential operation. I can't tell you what it was because you might guess who the other person was. Anyway, there was somebody in a foreign country would ring me up every day and ask me to prepare 10 different scenarios for what we, what we might possibly do. And we were just like running around in circles doing work that was going to be of no value to anybody. Um, in that situation, I couldn't do a thing. Um, I was not, I didn't have the relationship to um, ring up and say, look, we, we don't, um, we don't, we're just spinning our wheels here, boss. You're actually driving us all mad. Interestingly enough, um, there was a, you know, I just thought about this. There was a higher moral imperative that he could use to um, fight back. And that was to say, well, it's really important. What if we're called? This is a difficult task. You need to be well prepared. So um, he might have scuppered me on that one. Um, but in this uh, time when we're working from home, I, I think it's still important. But not by email, as I said, and not by SMS. We have the potential to look at whatever the problem is and then just, um, in fact, we almost have an excuse saying, I'm, I'm finding it rather um, difficult to clarify this, to understand that. Um, I'd like to speak to you more often. Is it possible we can have regular meetings? So I think you can do it um, if you have to, if it's really interfering. Like I said before, you, you only coach upwards when it hasn't been asked for if there's an issue that's getting in the way of meeting your objectives or the organization's objectives. I can't see any difference between um, working from home and working um, in your, current, your normal work environment, except you've got to be very, very careful about how you express it and make sure you do it um, face to face or on the phone. Yeah, I was actually thinking and reflecting, as you were saying, about defence forces and Air Force in particular and how, you know, when you're on deployment, it can be that sense of isolation, not, not the working from home, but you, you do have that sense of isolation where you are leading and you need to be able to connect in with your, your leader or your manager or your boss. Mm. And so I can see how the five Ps work from that perspective. And I would have thought that defence forces and air force in particular have got a lot to teach us about that working in isolation um that might be a conversation for another day but i was something yeah. i was just reflecting on yes it, it might be because uh, 
we have this thing called mission command in defense where we 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 certainly empower units to go and do their job without looking over their shoulder every um, 30 seconds and that's um it's so tied up with the principles of coaching of building trust and rapport and empowering people um, with all that that implies uh, that uh, I suppose if I can refer back to Anita's talk yesterday, and I'm not sure if everybody heard it, but having little hubs of coaches all over Australia, um, but trusting them to get on and to um, grow coaching in their area and to grow personal development without telling them what to do every five minutes. It's a similar, um, a similar expression, really. Mm. Yeah, I was just reflecting how Air Force could probably do that better than a lot of organisations because um, there is a lot of, uh, uh, in, in some organisations as I've been hearing, it's like, well, I can't mm. see them, so how do I know they're doing their jobs? Whereas Air Force's mission command approach is allow people and empower them to do their jobs and let them get yeah. on with it. So yeah, exactly. a different kind of ethos there. Uh, I am watching the time. Can I, shall mm. we pick up a couple more questions and I then... Yeah, I'll just, uh, not too much more to go, but do you mind if I just talk about Maribel's? Um, I just had a look at what Maribel had put in there. Can I? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so she, she's really asked. Don't mind, mm, I don't mind if, uh, if you or others uh, talk about that as well. Basically, how do you coach when there's no respect or um, relationship between the two? And, mm. and for me, and this is for me only, and I'm, I'm not sure of the context, but it comes down to this, that if there's something that's interfering so badly with the work, then you do have to coach upwards and you do go through the five P's and, then, and you start it. You, it does take moral courage. I'm aware of that, but it doesn't mean you have to expend your moral courage on it either. Because sometimes um, you, if you don't fit with the organisation, you either have to put up with it or leave. Um, now, I'm not giving that as advice, but uh, you, you, if the imperative is to coach up, then you should do it. Um, and I know of numerous examples where people have left because their boss was such a mongrel. And uh, if that's what has to happen, then that's what has to happen. The imperative to coach doesn't change because of your status in the boss's eyes. It might change how you approach them, that's all. Mm -hmm. And Mary Bell's talking here about uh, when she feels that she doesn't have the boss's respect. So yeah. that, that's the context there. Yeah. Thank and you. maybe uh, you can get someone else to do the coaching upwards for you. Maybe you can. It might not have to be you. Um, all right. Well, let, I'll just quickly, let's get on to the last bit then, um, Natalie, and I'll, I'll um, take some questions at the end. I've thought about this coaching culture of coaching assisting in coaching upwards. And you might know that in Air Force, we've started to think that there's so many different cultures and they all work together, um, that we've started to just talk about Air Force culture. And that doesn't mean we don't have a coaching culture. It means that it's a subset. Um, so having had that disclaimer in there, um, because you can have so many different layers um, operating in an organization. There's many roles for a leader or a manager in an, in an organization, but surely the most important is to develop others, to get the best out of them, uh, for them and for the organization. And that means having a coaching mindset underpinning what we do. So it's best practice, it's best practice. And I, I just have to give you this quote I found from, it was written by Kevin Cashman in a Forbes online article coaching is the art of drawing forth potential onto the canvas of high performance well i like that <laughs> and that's surely the leader's job um surely he's an he or she is an artist in that sense and so if you have a coaching coaching culture in the workplace um you're going to be able to do that fairly easily everybody will be familiar with the language everybody will be having coaching conversations and perhaps the most valuable component there is that there'll be levels of trust that exist so i trust my boss i trust that when i when i coach my boss he's going to value it 
Um, I trust my boss will coach me and I'll develop and grow as a person. And that trust overcomes all the barriers that can be created, real or imagined, by hierarchy. Um, it's, it's the key ingredient. So if there's trust and we're doing this every day, we're having all the conversations, it's what we do around here, we don't stay below the line, but we get above the line, we're very positive, we seek solutions to things, we don't sit around whinging, we have a buzzy workplace, then it makes it a lot easier to coach upwards. So we really need to imbue that practice of coaching inside into the fiber of our organization. And you know, um, you can even have informal coaching. We know we, we do it all the time. And if you can get to the stage where you don't even ask, hey boss, can I give you some coaching on that? You just say, hey boss, um, that was great. I've got some coaching tips. It, it, you've got all of the openness there going, everyone's collaborating, you're not doing it all by yourself. And boy, oh boy, in this complex world, jobs are complex. And the boss that tries to go it alone uh, will come undone. So it doesn't make sense to do it all for yourself, all by yourself. And it makes sense to rely on your experts and it makes sense to take advice from them uh, and work with them. So it doesn't have to be lonely at the top if you've got rapport, if you've got trust and you've got true collaboration. So that's how I think it assists. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really great reflection. Thank you. And I noticed um, Bridget's reflection as well that uh, she's looped back to working from home actually. And one of the contexts is that we can take the time to plan in a quiet space and preparation. And, and I was thinking about what you were saying there about building trust, um, Ian, and how we should take the time to reflect on that actually, mm. and how how coaching upwards actually enables the building of trust um, is something that, that I was actually thinking about um, as you were talking. Yeah, and I, that's where I like my five Ps. It, it helps me to focus on those good components of coaching upwards that will build the trust. And it gives me a chance by using that framework um, to avoid the pitfalls um, which will destroy trust. And it, it's um, nice to have, it, have sort of some structure around what you're going to do. It gives you confidence um, and, it, and that gives you that courage to go and do it. Mm. Yes, I agree with you. So we've got, um, to, we've got time for a couple more questions here. Uh, Mike asked one earlier, Ian, um, just thinking back to your, uh, the, everything you know about coaching, he says, do you recommend being conversationally agile based on the style of the boss? So we've just come off webinars talking about um, personality preferences and the styles and, and, the, and the like. And he's asking, uh, do you recommend being conversationally agile based on the style of the boss when he or she is managing, leading or coaching? So any thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I do. I do recommend being conversationally agile. Um, I would, I would um, caveat that though by, and, and I'll talk a bit more about it, but you, you have to be yourself, all right? So you can't try to be someone you're not. Uh, your boss will know that if, if you're not. And I'm not talking about it showing just normal nervousness and stuff like that, but don't try to um, script it as if you're a barrister in a courtroom and you're gonna deliver this thing. But be agile, it's the same, um, to me, it's the same principle as mirroring. It's understanding the language the person uses and what they do. So yes, I'd agree. Um, if I understand coaching as conversational agility to the depth that you're talking about, which I'm not a, an expert on it, but I do. And I also recommend that if you're building a team, uh, why not all get together and do some disc profiling or MBTI or a whole bunch of other things, get to understand how the person works, what pushes their hot buttons and what pushes their um, happy buttons. So it's all to me part of one big um, amorphous blob of relationships and conversations, understand 
how you're going to feel, understand how the boss is going to feel, and work your conversation around that. And yeah, if you can build trust through being agile, conversationally agile, then do it. I hope I've understood what your question was. Um, be yourself, but do also understand how that conversation is going to work from there in uh, and how they'll react. Which comes back to the planning, doesn't it? So putting some yeah. thought into that planning. Mm -hmm. And uh, Vi's picked up a very good comment here. She says um, it reminds her, she says, thank you, Ian, for your interesting session. And uh, she said it reminds her very much of the importance to first seek to understand and then to understood. And, and she thinks mm -hmm. that's the key uh, to planning in your five P's, that seeking to understand first. Yes, and I hope, I hope we all do this before we get to a tricky situation where we've got to sit down and nut it all out. I want it to be part of our day-to-day -day life. I would like it to be, uh, we understand how someone likes to work and we understand how they react and we understand their pressures on them. We understand our people. That's so important for a boss. Um, gosh, I'm going to launch into another lecture now on what leaders do, but leaders <laughs> understand their people and they can only do that by asking questions. Ergo, you want to understand your boss, you can only do that by asking questions, by having a conversation and getting to know them. Hmm. Yeah, and I'm, I'm conscious of the time now, just checking if there's any more other questions coming in, but um, maybe you might um, share personally, Ian, like you've always been a, an amazing leader and a great coach. Is there anything in particular um, about coaching that, I, I, I'm not sure what, I, what the question is, but is there anything in particular about coaching that you want to offer us or a personal reflection on the difference that really embodying coaching has made to you? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, what I learnt most from coaching was the fact that even though I had so much experience, some, some in the school of hard knocks, um, that that experience can't be translated to someone else by just telling them, this is my experience, you now you go and do it. But for me, it was the, the eye opening was, oh, if this person comes up with their own solution and their own goal or their own strategy, that's going to work um, on so many different levels that all of your coaches will know. That for me, I mean, I did understand not getting in the space. I did understand not um, um, giving my ideas all the time, but I didn't quite understand why. And as I've been coaching, as I've gone through personal development, I understand now it's because it's, I'm, I'm trying to invest myself into that other person if I'm doing it. They need to build and grow what's inside them. It's Remember that lovely quote, drawing forth potential onto the canvas of high performance. It's, it's not painting the picture for them. And I'll give you one more little insight. I always used to worry about great questions because I thought, how can I come up with these great questions? Then I realized they're the simple ones. The simple questions actually help the person to open up because they're not unpicking your question. They're just opening up. So they're, they're the two things that I've learned and grown mostly with or by or from coaching. Yeah, I really appreciate you sharing that because um, I think a lot of us on the line feel the same way that, um, you know, we're learning about coaching more and more as we go on, even the mm. super experienced coaches. And there's a few of us saying on the line here that we wish we had the five P's model <laughs> earlier and we wish we had been aware of coaching um, earlier in our careers as well. Yeah. So um, I think it doesn't matter what age we are, we could always think of back to the last decade where we wish we had have had coaching <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had a, a young gun recently um, in their 20s saying, you know, I wish I had known about coaching when I was back at school. So, um, you know, it doesn't really um, matter what age or rank or level. Um, it's applicable across the board from that perspective. Yeah. And one just last question uh, before, we, um, before we tie off. Um, you did talk about um, uh, resistance. And so, um, and you know, you wish that 
oh, the, the move from telling people what to do as opposed to coaching. And Vanessa's asked a question around how does that fit with urgency and emergency? So um, there's obviously a time and place for coaching, but how have yeah. you navigated the urgency and emergency uh, situation well, as well? It's, for me, it's quite straightforward. I hope, um, I hope it doesn't sound wrong, but you know, in an emergency or urgency, if someone's doing the wrong thing, you step in and make it happen right. Um, we've often discussed this. Um, mm. An example would be if if you're flying in a um, in a jet aircraft, it's um, single engine, single occupant, single pilot. Um, they have to react very quickly to what's going on, and uh, they're trained to do that. They're also trained to analyse very carefully the situation so they don't do the wrong thing same with a multi crewed aircraft the first thing usually what hap that happens when there's an emergency is that um, the pilot the captain will assess is this something i have to react to straight away or have i time to do some deeper analysis because if i have to act straight away and i get it wrong it could be a disaster and so they would sit there and say, all right, well, this is happening. Let's have a look at it. What does, what does everybody think? How can we deal with this? Um, oh, the engine's shut down now. What are we going to do? So um, urgency and emergency means that you have to act straight. Urgency and emergency mean you have to react straight away. But whenever there's a gap to think, you should always take the opportunity to look around for another solution. It's not to do with coaching. It's to do with coming up with the optimum solution. But if somebody's going to do the wrong thing in an emergency situation, then you will still step in. Um, I hope that's clear enough. That yeah, I think you it does. You can't just put everything in a, can't put things in a box and say, um, this is too urgent. I, I don't have time for coaching, which, because that would just give people um, a crutch to do that. And really, I think you should be able to um, say, this is urgent, but how urgent is it? Can I actually take a little more time and perhaps come up with an optimum solution? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that goes back to your five P's as well. So planning, mm. working out what's right, the best approach here as well. So yeah, yeah thank you. Well, Ian, um, what can I say? On behalf of everyone that's um, joined in Coach Week, on behalf of um, Heather Jane and the team at Synergy Global and the team at Open Door, we are really appreciative of your time. Um, it is such a privilege to learn from you and you are so open and you're so giving of your, uh, of your not only your tips, but I think the wisdom and experience. Um, I've listened to your presentation a few times now through the Certificate Forum Workplace and Business Coaching Program when you've delivered it to Air Force, I think all those maybe 10 times or more. Each time I've taken a series of notes and I've got a new series of notes today. So um, everyone is thanking you on the chat um, yeah. and on, on behalf of the team, thank you so much. And I just encourage everyone, um, hook into those other Coach Week uh, sessions that we have. There's so much on offer across all levels of experience. So um, I thank you today, Ian, and um, wish you all a good afternoon. Thank you. Natalie and let me remind any Air Force people out there to have a look at um, the coaching week opportunities in Air Force as well um, oh and uh, Army and Navy we, we don't mind them and thank you so much for the <laughs> and I'm looking forward I'm looking forward to the next three days as well fantastic thank you everybody we'll say good afternoon for now